Yesterday at this table, we had a 68-minute conversation with Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif. Tonight, part two, a conversation about the nuclear deal, about the relationship between Iran and the United States, and about the possibilities of future engagement. Here is that conversation. If, in fact, there was a nuclear agreement, is it likely to lead to, likely to lead to, uh, more cooperation in terms of U.S.-Iranian relations, U.S.-Iranian cooperation, uh, U.S.-Iranian uh, joint efforts, if it finds itself on the same side? Well, and, and do you somehow make the argument that if we can get past this nuclear agreement, we can work together to defeat our common enemy, in this case, ISIL, which is also the common enemy of your competitors in the region, the Saudis, for example? Well, I, I see a possibility for regional cooperation, which exists even now, on dealing with all these issues. I believe the United States needs to make a very serious assessment of how policies that were based on a paradigm that, from our perspective, is outdated, does not work for this time in, in, in world history. This is, this is a bit uh, maybe philosophical. Uh, and I've had six years of being philosophical when I was out of government. Yes. But, but, but you got to look at it this way, that in, in a globalized world, zero-sum games, that is, you're trying to impose a cost on somebody you don't consider to be friendly, does not work. We have common enemies. We have common challenges. We need to work for this so-called win-win situations where everybody makes again. Mm -hmm. You cannot gain security at the expense of insecurity mm -hmm. of others. This it must have become clear. I believe the United States is moving in that direction, I hope, hasn't made that decision. Mm -hmm. It's still, I mean, if, if you look at the nuclear issue, the United States, some at least in the United States, including those you mentioned, and the op-eds that they have written, they consider their gain to be our loss, and our loss, and our gain to be their loss. I think this is fundamentally flawed. Okay, but do you this, think the same approach, thing? Do you, vi do you view an American loss as a win for Iran? Not necessarily. So you're saying we... Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I do not we believe... We look at a zero-sum game, I, I do not but believe, you don't. I, I do not believe that in a globalized world, anybody with any rationality can look at the international situation as a zero-sum game. It is not zero-sum. Unfortunately, many people do. Do, does your government see the United States as the great Satan? Well, a phrase our, that's been used by Ayatollahs. Well, our people consider... Not your people. No, no, no. Our people. The government in Iran follows the people. It's not the other way yeah. around. Our people, if you look at the polls, you, you, if you look at the polls, the polls that were even conducted by American polling uh, uh, establishments, including Pew, a lot of polls indicate that the Iranian people are skeptical of U.S. intentions, even when it comes to nuclear negotiations. Yeah. I believe, I believe the United States needs to convince the Iranians that it does not harbor its intentions against the Iranian people. It's the people and who the, count. And the Iranian government needs to convince the American people that it does not want nuclear weapons, which would lead to a proliferation of weapons in the, mid, in the Middle East, in your region of the Gulf. You need to convince the American people of that uh, because that's what they fear. They fear that if <laughs> Iran gets nuclear weapons, it's not that they're going to attack somebody. It's just that everybody is going to all of a sudden have nuclear weapons. The Saudis will reach out well, to the Pakistanis and everybody else will want nuclear weapons and we'll I have think, a... I think as, as several... Is that a real possibility? I think as several secretaries of state wrote in, in, in the Wall Street Journal, yes. I believe, some right. time ago, it is time for everybody to think of a world without nuclear weapons because that's the ultimate okay. answer. So why I, not... I, no, 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 hold on. Yeah, yeah. Be, 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 because you've got to make yourself accountable to the same criteria that you want the rest of the world to be accountable to and the United States, which has used nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It, it does not have 
the authority to advise others on what to do and what not to do. But we, but, have, but, we have made our own decision. We believe the, the, that nuclear weapons did not provide security for anybody. They will not provide security for anybody. We have made a very do you think they solid... Can solid determination that nuclear weapons run counter to our Islamic right. values. I understand. Hatemi said that to me. Ahmadinejad said that to me. Rouhani said that to me. In one-on-one -on -one conversation. Sure. All of them. We sure. don't want nuclear weapons. Sure. Why do you think the world doesn't trust you? Well, because lies have been spread of all people by the Israelis who are the only ones in our region who possess nuclear weapons, the only ones who, uh, who are not a member of the NPT in our region. We want, actually yesterday I was talking to the Egyptian foreign minister, we all want to establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Then, Why don't you push Israel to accept this? Because tomorrow, tomorrow, if you have everybody in the Middle East accepting, and everybody is there ready to accept, no nuclear weapons in the Middle East. With all the inspections you want in the world, that we will not have nuclear weapons. So it's not, I mean, Netanyahu does not have any authority to become sort of non-proliferation guru of the world. This guy sits on 200 uh, war, nuclear warheads, uh, which are illegal, have been, give, have been developed in contravention of every international norm and treaty on non-proliferation. So let's be serious. You want to be serious, Iran never wanted nuclear okay, weapons, but, but, never okay, wants then, nuclear let, weapons. But, uh, I granted the point that you're making about Israel, they do have nuclear weapons, they not, did not sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, and, and, and everybody is aware of, of that fact. So why don't you deal with that fact? That's the fact. I mean, what is said about Iran are allegations. Okay, but, okay. This is the fact on the ground, and I don't see anybody. Iran did not invade any of its neighbors. Israel, every two years, invades Gaza. Every other year, uh, takes uh, an but, operation. But I don't want to go uh, off into that, only because... I know you, you don't. Well, no, it's not because of the reason you think. It's because you get into the question of who provoked who and, and all of that, as you know. Uh, and it looks to me like your friends, Hamas, has is, is survived this, you know, and some will argue, and they will argue you know, that they survived that war and they came out stronger in some cases. Usually people who resist aggression came okay, out but stronger. So let me ask some basic questions that a lot of people want to know. One is that, you know, why, why don't you want to provide? This is a simple thing to do. The history, the history that John Kerry and others have asked you to provide so that they would have a basis to look at. They'd know more about what you had done and have a basis to make an evaluation about the future. You refused to include that. No, 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 that. we didn't. You we have didn't not refuse. allowed a history of your... No, 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 no. Come on. Hold on. Let's, let's take one step at a time. You make an, somebody makes an allegation against you. It's up to them to prove it, not for you to disprove it. Allegations have been made against Iran one after the other. Iran, hold on, okay. Iran has been inspected in the last 10 years more than any other country in the world, save for Japan. The only country that has been inspected more than Iran, mm -hmm. based on IAEA report, I'm referring not to the IAEA report recently, based on the 200, 2013 IAEA report. Wait, as it, IAEA spent more money on Iran than any other country other than Japan. And do you re recognize that the IAEA says that there are unanswered questions? There are They have at least 10 yeah. basic unanswered 12. questions. 12. 12. Okay. So the, these are the questions. Unanswered questions. Yes, my friend. And all, if, if you want to prove your point, Did you ask answer the their questions. Did you ask the IAEA when they got the questions? They got the questions based on allegations that, the, that Israel provided to them. Now, if, if people who are themselves violating the NPT continue to accuse others who have a track record of c uh, complying with their obligations under the NPT with allegations. Now, what we can do, and we have been trying with the IAEA, is to develop a framework for us to answer those questions. But it has to be clear that you, that proving the, the negative is impossible. You know that. Any lawyer will tell no, you I'm, I'm, that I'm, it is impossible to prove a negative. Somebody who makes an allegation, who presents an allegation, must provide the okay. evidence for that. Okay, the, problem is, the problem is the IAEA has been searching Iran 
for the last 10 years has spent more time in Iran than any You've other. You've got nothing to hide. Let them come in. Let they them, in. Let they them do whatever in. they want to. Because no, no, you've got, no, you and you're see. saying I, we have nothing to hide. Yes, we have centrifuges we want to use for peaceful purposes. we got nothing to hide. So I say to you, inspection is a big deal for trust and verification, or non-trust and non-verification. -ver Whatever you want to define it as, it's a big deal for the Americans. If there is a deal. And for the IAEA. Sure. If there is a deal, yeah. Iran will accept the highest international level of inspections. That is the additional protocol. How about go anywhere, anytime? Come on. Go anywhere, anytime. You're talking about sovereign countries. There are international standards. Go anywhere, anytime, where? Which country is prepared to give you go anywhere, anytime? All countries have industrial secrets, have military secrets. But if there are bases, and there is, there, there is an international criteria, people come up with these hysteric arguments. We have an international set of measures, internationally agreed, being implemented in a lot of countries. And Iran has said that if there is an agreement, that if we choose the path of cooperation instead of the path of confrontation, because you cannot choose the path of confrontation and expect the other side to cooperate. I mean, it's either or. Yeah. You cannot have we're them. trying to get trust here. Okay. We, we, we're trying to go in and the direction of and building. Verification. Okay, fine. Verification and trust. That requires you to accept certain norms, certain international practices that are now agreed upon and available to all countries. Yeah. Iran is prepared to accept the highest level of international yeah, and, inspection and that, is, I, that is available. I, just to show you that in the interest of what little that I do know about the deal and what I've understood from different people, Secretary Kerry has said in conversations, when the question was raised of him, like I'm raising the question with you by Margaret Brennan, uh, the State Department correspondent at CBS, ask him about the inspections and why should we believe the inspections this time when they were thwarted in the past. John Kerry said, as I heard it, these are the most extensive inspections we've ever seen, those that are proposed as part of this agreement. Well, Is uh, that true or not? Was uh, the secretary he, speaking the truth then? Well, well, the secretary certainly speaks the truth to the American people, and he can, he can uh, say and uh, present the inspections that are taking going to take place under what is known internationally as the additional but, but protocol tell me, do you believe these are the most extensive intrusive inspections that you've ever been subjected to those that are yes, encapsulated iran, in this iran agreement is accepting, iran is accepting to implement the additional protocol and the additional protocol is the highest standard of inspection that is available in the world so he's not lying if Iran implements the additional protocol, Iran would be implementing the highest standard of inspection. But that is not exclusive to Iran. That is the standard of inspection that a lot of that some other countries, not all other countries, are implementing. But let me tell you something: Iran was prepared to implement that in 2003. Actually, why did everything actually, fail in 2003? Actually, we implemented the additional protocol from 2003 to 2005. The United States government at that time, unfortunately, chose the path of con mm -hmm. confrontation to and torpedoed the possibilities for cooperation. And the same people, the same people who killed the opportunity for cooperation then are advising now to kill this opportunity. Now, I believe it would be prudent for the United States to look back at the history and see how much it gained from, confront, uh, from choosing the path of confrontation if, with Iran for the past eight, if, nine if, years. If, in fact, uh, for some reason, Iran does not allow the inspections that are prescribed, uh, that's a violation of the agreement. And the United States would want to reimpose, add to the sanctions. Well, you see, we have a mechanism in place that if Iran does not comply with its part of the deal, or if the United States and other uh, P5, P5 plus, plus one, one right. countries do not comply with their part of the deal, then the other side, after going through a procedure, will be free 
to go back. This is obvious. It's, it's a balanced approach. It's a reciprocal approach. We call it actually mm -hmm. reciprocal in, in, in the agreement because it has to be a reciprocal. An agreement that is based on two sovereign countries dealing with each other must be reciprocal, must be based mm -hmm. on mutual respect. We're not going to start this. We haven't. I mean, Secretary Kerry and I did not waste all this time. 18 months. 18 months, nine hours in one sitting. Uh, over from nine o'clock in the evening till, till the six the, fo the following morning, on. simply to prepare a piece of paper that both of us are going to go home and start shredding. Mm -hmm. This is this is not. Well, you both did come home and and suggest different. Uh, well, uh, th this was this was an unfortunate situation pushed by domestic politics okay. here and there. I I doubt it because I didn't produce a fact sheet. I didn't produce a fact sheet last time around. Right. I didn't produce a fact sheet this time. What I will rely upon, is. and I think it's best to rely upon, is the agreement that will come out. I think people here and people in Iran should wait a couple of months. We will come up with an agreement. The, the, ter the terms of that agreement will be public. It's not, nothing will be secret. I mean, in this day and age, you cannot keep anything <laughs> secret no. in this world. You know that. I do. I mean, whatever we agree will be out in the open in a couple of, uh, in a couple of days' time or a couple of hours' time, if, if we are more accurate. So let us, let us wait another couple of months. We will come up with an agreement with clearly laid out terms. By, and by June 30th. By June 30th, I hope. Yeah. And we will implement it. And we did not waste all this time, 18 months of negotiations, to prepare an agreement that e either side wants to uh, flout immediately upon uh, reaching that What's agreement. the odds of that happening? Is it Of reaching an agreement? Yes. If there is the mutual political will to abandon the path of confrontation and uh, Go for cooperation. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the, I the think path we of have, confrontation we have all the ingredients. And, and the path of secrecy, abandon the path of secrecy and covertness. And That's what they scared of. They, no, they were, let, know, me, I'm, let, let me make sure. this point, because I'm, I'm really reflecting on what people say at this table. Please. They worry, they really worry most of all, not how many centrifuges you have. What they really worry about is that you can secretly have a facility like you did last time and were forced to disclose. No, here, again. They, you see, they, you, they, they, that's what they worried about. Charlie, they are worried about a covert facility that they can't know about and don't have access to. Charlie, let's look at the realities on the ground. What happened to Iran was a pattern of denial. Iran owns, owns a part of a French consortium producing enriched uranium, 10% of Eurodif. We haven't been able to get a gram of uranium from them. You know that the United States in the 1950s and 60s in the Atoms for Peace uh, project built a nuclear research reactor in Tehran. Then after the revolution, we started to need fuel for that reactor. The United States refused to give us fuel for the reactor that it had built. It's a peaceful reactor. It cannot produce weapons, but the United States refused to give us fuel. We went and bought it in 1990 from Argentina. Then in early 2000s, we needed more fuel. That fuel ran out. We asked for fuel from the IAEA. They said, we don't give it to you. We said, we will build it ourselves. And then they started to panic. Why is Iran building its own fuel? Why? Because you didn't give it to us. Okay. You see, Iranian people, we have the scientific base. We have the scientific capability. We have the technological capability. People cannot wish that technological capability yeah. away. It's there on the ground. Maybe. What we are prepared to do is to ensure that that scientific and technological capability is used exclusively for peaceful purposes. That's what we're interested in. But, but you cannot, again, start history at the point that you wanted to start. You got to start history when right. the United States yeah. government went across the world yeah. trying to yeah. deny 
Iran of the fuel to run our reactor. You've been listening to the Secretary of State and you've been listening to American... And, he's been, and, to and he's been listening to you. And that's good. That's a really good thing that you've been talking. Have you changed your mind about the United States? You guys have been sitting there. You both want this to work for individual reasons. I mean, for reasons to reflecting of your country's wishes. No, we both want this to work you, because we know that the other approach is counterproductive, that the other approach does not produce results. I mean, confrontation ha harms us, it harms U.S. interests, and it doesn't advance any objective. That is a realization that has been key to everybody sitting and trying to resolve this. So we have tested something that was not conducive to an outcome that either side believed to be in its interest. Now we're, we're testing another option, an option that we always preferred. We preferred that option in early 2000. You mentioned that. When we, when we made suggestions. Right. No, I want, I want you to understand, and I want the American public to understand, that it's not the sanctions that has brought Iran here. We were always at the negotiating table. We were always prepared to reach a negotiated solution. It was unfortunately segments of the United States administration who believed, and unfortunately continue to believe, that they can impose their views on the rest of the world. They can't. And the sooner yeah. they realize that, yeah. the better, all, okay. the better yeah. we yeah. all will be. The President of the United States believes that sanctions brought you to the table, but he's prepared because he believes and it, it's important for Iran to be and not to have nuclear weapons, notwithstanding a, a what you've said and so many people have said we have not made a decision. But let me no, just... No, no, I never said we have not made a decision. We have made a decision. We made a decision not to have right. nuclear weapons. And, and others have said that to me as I recited earlier. Let me talk about the breakout period for a second. What is the breakout period? Breakout is a hype. Okay, let me walk through it then. <laughs> Most people think the breakout period is the time if you did everything you needed to do. If you broke off inspections, it's how long it would take you to get to one nuclear yeah, you see. weapon. Uh, wait, let me finish. Please do. The conventional wisdom is two to three months. The Americans have expressed some preference and that it be a year, and that that extension from two to three months to a year lasts for 10 years. What's wrong with that? Well, let me, this, this is... I wish you'd help me understand. I don't this, understand. This is, uh, and if I may, yes, I'll try. Okay. I'm, I'm not an expert, but at least I know the jargon. Okay. Breakout meant, in the normal jargon, that goes back to Cold War and to various discussions that took place uh, during that time. And anybody, this is so-called disarmament 101. Yes. Breakout is the time that is required for a country to build and test a bomb, to build a nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. a single nuclear weapon. Right. Now, the calculation for that is something that requires first to have the fissile material, then to uh, convert that fissile material into uh, an explosive device for a bomb and to build a bomb and then to build a warhead and all of that to be able to explode the bomb. Now, what they're talking about when it comes to Iran, they're talking about the time that is required for Iran to build necessary fissile material for one bomb. This is not to build a bomb. No. So this is where the hype comes in. Right. This is where the hype comes in. For the past eight years, Iran has suffered all these sanctions, and we had enough material to build eight bombs. Eight bombs? Eight bombs, and we never did. So How much material is that? 8,000 kilograms. You of 8,000 kilograms? 8,000 kilograms of enriched, of enriched uranium. uranium. During, the, during President Ahmadinejad's time, where the United States and the rest of the world put all the pressure on him, demonized him, tried to create a security threat out of a country that never posed a threat against anybody. Eight years, 8,000 kilograms, eight bombs. Not a single bomb, 
nobody even contests this argument. So, let, well, let me try. Breakout, <laughs> breakout is a hysteria, is a hype. But Iran doesn't want to build nuclear weapons. We are prepared to create the, the atmosphere of confidence. That will be done through certain measures that we have accepted. May I it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that I accept breakout because I believe breakout is a hype. Okay, but and I believe nobody should accept breakout. People should listen to reality. People should listen to science, not to hype. May I, may I make one point? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> if it's that simple, why don't you sh ship that enriched uranium that you can make a bomb out of the country? Ship it to Russia, for example. Well, I'm it not, was, neg it was I'm not no, negotiating I'm with you, but that's, uh, that's a part of the deal. But I thought it had been pulled back. No, it hasn't been pulled back. It's a part of the deal. Not, what we do with that is something that we have already agreed upon. So you'll ship all no, that? Uh, what we do with that, I mean, you will see when the agreement comes out what we will do with that, but we will address that issue. That I can tell you right now. When the deal is out, if there is a deal, when the deal is out, you will see what we do with that. But we are prepared. First of all, you have to take that into consideration that for eight years, during a time when we had confrontation, we were sitting on what they, this hype, considers eight bombs, and we never did build a bomb because we believe bombs do not create security for anybody. Is that the only reason? That's the only, only reason. reason That's the only reason. If if Iran had the intention of building a bomb, nobody could have prevented us from doing that. But we didn't. We haven't gone in that direction because unlike people who used nuclear bombs, and I'm sorry to use this, against innocent people in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we do not believe that any moral argument can justify the use of nuclear weapons. None whatsoever. I went before the International Court of Justice in 1996 and spoke for 90 minutes arguing that no, under no circumstances, is it legal to use a nuclear weapon. Under all circumstances, using nuclear weapons is illegal, immoral, unjustified, and most important of all, will not provide any security for anybody. This is our conviction. And that is why we didn't build the bomb. And that is why we won't build the bomb in the future. Then this you can take to the bank. Then why don't you do everything that humanly possible to convince the world and specifically the P5 plus one countries to say to them, we so passionately believe that nuclear weapons are awful and we don't want them and we will do everything that you need and more to convince you of that. Rather than arguing over every little point, rather than refusing to answer some questions, rather than doing all that stuff, no, you which, see, we're not which in contributes court. to the we're not, we're not, disbelief. We're not in a court. We, uh, and nobody has been given the role of a prosecutor. No, and, 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 uh, and this is not mutual. And you understand, respect. I'm not trying to prosecute here. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is, no, is no, figure no, out no, where you no, are. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about the yeah, negotiations right, with P5 right, plus one. Right. You and I are old friends. Yeah, we can, we exactly, can talk freely. Exactly. What, 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 what's the point here is that this is a negotiation between sovereign states. This is not one side demanding something from the other. We have a compounded mutual mistrust between these two, I mean, particularly Iran and the United right. States. And the rest are, are just there, some of them with concern, some of them with concern similar to ours. Some are concerned about sanctions. Some believe that most people believe that the United, sanctions, United States sanctions are illegal. Illegal. So what we are doing is that we are negotiating the terms of an agreement not an instrument of surrender by anybody. We don't want the United States to surrender. The United States can, cannot expect Iran to capitulate. And I'm happy to hear both President Obama and Secretary Kerry understanding this, that capitulation is a dream, is an illusion. You will never get that. 
but you will okay. get. I mean, it, it, this is important because some people believe that through pressure you can bring people to capitulate. That won't happen, not in Iran and nowhere else in the world. And I believe some people in the United States ne need to change that mentality. Otherwise, we will be stuck with the same problem but that we've been... But do you believe that includes the president or not? I, I hope not. Because he's spoken to how much he respects the I, I hope not. Iranian and, people and, and how much he respects the Iranian uh, history. Now, now we, how need, much we he need to prove that. We need to prove that. Each side needs to prove... Uh, uh, each uh, side? Each side. Each side, sure. It, it, it's been, as I said, it's been compounded mutual mistrust. We believe that the mistrust of Iran is not justified. We have reason to mistrust the United States, to, to have less confidence that is necessary in the United States because of our history. Now, what we need to do instead of going back and rehashing old history is to have a serious agreement in place and implement it. We have shown in the past 18 months, and everybody has testified to that, that we implement what we agree. Some people are worried that Iran will implement again what it agrees to. I saw an op-ed in, in one of your papers saying that the biggest worry is for Iran to implement this part of the bargain. So what are people afraid of? Our people is, is peace an existential threat to some people? Is less tension and conflict an existential threat to some people? Are people ready to change that perspective, to change that paradigm? That's an opportunity here. Iran is an important country in the region. Iran is an important country. No one that I know denies that. So Even it's, those it, is, it is important to deal with that country, with that people who will not capitulate, but who are there to engage. Iranian people have chosen the path of engagement. It's now high time, I believe, for the United States to choose the same path. I believe we have seen some signs. We need to see that come to fruition through an agreement that is respectful of Iran's rights and dignity. And I can assure you, if you have that agreement, Iran will implement that agreement because we believe that agreement is in the interest of everybody. I'm concerned, as you may know and expect, with some journalists that are in jail in your country, and I, I hope that the human rights questions can, can be discussed and, and, as well. There is, uh, we do not jail people for their opinions. The government has a plan to improve, enhance human rights in the country as every government should. And I, I believe we have an obligation as a, as a government to our own people to do that. But people who commit crimes, who violate the laws of a country, cannot hide behind being a journalist or being a political activist. People have to observe the law. I have to observe the law. When I'm asked to go to the parliament, I may not like it, but I have to go to the parliament and to respond to their question. And I believe it is important for everybody to respect the rule of law and to allow the political process, the judicial process in Iran to run its course. And I believe at the end of the day, everybody will be best served by that. Well, I hope so, because I, they're, they're reporters that I know from the Washington Post, you know, who are going through that judicial process as we speak. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Our conversation with the foreign minister of Iran. Back in a moment, stay with us.